بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه العزيز بعد عبد الله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين آمنوا أشد حبا لله وقال قل إن كنتم تحبون الله فاتبعوني يحبكم الله ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم الله هو الرحيم وقال تعالى وأنكحوا الأيام منكم والصالحين من عبادكم وإمائكم إن يكونوا فقراء يغنيهم الله من فضله والله واسع عليم وقال تعالى واللاتي يأتين الفاحشة منكم وقال تعالى ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها وجعل بينكم مودة ورحمة إن في ذلك لآية لقوم يتفكرون صلى الله عليه وسلم عظيم. Once again, السلام عليكم. الحمد لله it's great to have all of you back. Um, in order for real talk to remain real, we must shave off an element of formality. Uh, so let me start off by telling you, um, you know, about the topic. To be honest with you, the way it works is Real Talk is organized by you know the wonderful organizers, and the arrangement was they assigned me the topic, and I have to figure out how to you know say make it work. So that's kind of what happened here. In case any of you were wondering as to what the ambiguity or the obscurity behind love story movie version is, it's basically a title was given to me, and I was told to make it work. So here I am, inshallah. Y'all at the end of Real Talk, let me know if I made it work. Inshallah, okay? So let's take off formality by starting off on a lighter note, but the reason why I recited those four specific ayat in the beginning is because I'm going to be using them to kind of guide me throughout the talk. Right? The theme contained in these ayat that I have recited before you, I'm going to tell you what they are. That's basically going to be my guide, that's going to be the motto, that's going to be the theme throughout the talk. Every talk is going to revolve around the theme, a message that is going to be, you know, possibly going to be getting across to people. But in order for us to really benefit from any gems or any stories or any incidents, any love stories or anything that we're about to hear, we need to have the theme in mind. So the theme, let's start off with the ayat. The theme is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about love in general. Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Those people who believe, love pertains to them. What does love look like to them? أَشَدُّ حُبًّا They are very intensely in love. Nay, they are most intensely in love. لِلَّهِ That love, the most intense of it. The, the, the most passionate of it. The most sacred of it is reserved for believers only for Allah. Nobody else. So that is another major theme of this talk. Keep that in mind. Allah, when He talks about love in the Quran, this is again one of the most beautiful things that He says to us pertaining to what love should look like in a Muslim's mind or in a Muslim's framework of mind. The وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ Those who believe their most intense portion of their love, the most intense portion of their love needs to be reserved specifically for God, for Allah. Another theme, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, now this is talking about you claiming to love Allah, right? Muslim who reads this ayah, the natural result will be, Oh Allah, my intense love is for you. You are my first love. You are my only love, oh Allah. A Muslim naturally, after reciting beautiful verses of intense love between creator and creation, naturally would respond to that. Allah says it's not sufficient to just respond to that with your words or make a claim. It has to have that, that fear you must have some flesh. And how do you get it? Also, I'm going to be merciful enough to tell you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another verse says, Say, O Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you really claim to love Allah, then you must follow me. Then you must follow me. Yuhibbukum Allah. Allah will love you too. Who doesn't want to be said about them? Allah loves me. 
Right? That's an intensely beautiful thing for a human to pray. Allah loves me. The Prophet is being told here that tell the people if they really want that, I'll give it to them. But how do you get there? If they're beholden, you gotta follow me. So if we're talking about love story, this is the most perfect, most appropriate that I can start with. The most intense of our love must be reserved for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then how do you make sure that claim of yours is true? To follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu So now, as it pertains to humans, love, not the love that we have for Rahim, for the kinship, the family, the blood relationship that we have, that's natural. And then when it's removed or when some things happen that make it waver a little bit, uh, you understand that that's just kind of how things work between people. Never wavers between Allah and humans. Human beings and Allah, the love that we have for humans never goes anywhere. Because Allah is, is eternal. He's infinite. Now when a person attaches their love to him, that love is going to be infinite as well. But with human beings, we're finite. You know what I'm saying? We're, we're finite. So what do we now, as humans, use to love? This heart. The heart. And what does sun even mean in Arabic? It means something that turns and changes. It has multiple different, you know, ideas throughout the day. It intends to love something now, it intends to love something five minutes from now, and then it doesn't intend and it makes up its own decisions without consulting the mind as well. It's very likely that the sun changes because the word sun itself means change. Flipping around, constant flipping around. That's what sun is. Sun is like flipping around. Like, you know what I'm saying? On barbecue, you just flip it around. I want you to picture that because now the Prophet of Islam is even giving more vivid imagery. You're not supposed to have the imagery about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the imagery that the Prophet of Islam is trying to draw in our heads is for us humans to understand how much Allah controls his heart. He says, in the qulub, these things that flip around, these qulub, these hearts, bayna isbari al-Rahman, they're between the two fingers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't attribute physicality to God. We believe he created it, so he's above it. So what does this mean? He then says in another hadith or another riwayah, another narration, yuqallibuha kayfa shah. Allah flips it around. He, Allah, so it doesn't mean fingers to do it. The Prophet just, you know, said that to make sure that we understand how serious it is. Because when something is in between two fingers of someone, for instance, the light switch, all it takes is for this, for a dark room to go completely light. That's all it takes. So that's what imagery he wants to draw in our head, but not to attribute it to God. God now, in his own way, not through using any means that he does not need, but through his own way, has that much and even more control on the hearts of humans. So now that you understand that the primary tool that you're going to use to love another human is not even in your control, and the tool that they're going to use to love you back is not in their control, once that reality sinks in, then the seriousness of the occasion of two human beings coming together would then begin dawning upon a human. If you think you're capable all by yourself, without any need of religious intervention or divine intervention, of loving, that's very wrong. That's what point I'm trying to establish as our own. So that being said, since they was advertised as a love story, and I was told to do with this topic, you know, the best I can. So, thinking of a story, you can't really go wrong with the tabi'uni. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, follow me. Tell them, O Messenger Allah, follow me. His story. His love story. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not mine. Some of some, my some boys mess with me. You want to say your love story? Nah, no, bro, this is not about me. I'm a human. My story ain't even finishing. Right? We're all humans. So I love the circle of your love. I used to say, Whoever wants to take an example to follow should take an example of somebody who's dead. 
Because a live person, there is no guarantee that they're not going to be prone to temptation and fall period. And then he says, if you want to go and look for examples of that, those are the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. كانوا أبرها قلوبا they had the cleanest of hearts the righteous, the most righteous of hearts وأعمقها علما they had the most deep of knowledges وأبرها وأقلها تكلفا and they were the least in terms of formality they, had, they were real we are here to real talk they were the most raw, real people they were no formalities and now if these are great examples their teacher, if we had his example available to learn from, why would we need anything else? We can benefit from other things, but primary got to be this. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam must speak that it's not a seal of action. This is just talking about the circumstances of his marriage, of how he found love and how he will not have love. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the age of 25, so we're going to speak past him when he's now about 25 years old. 25 years old, he is single, he's not married yet. His circumstances in life are, he is working as a shepherd. He lives in the home of his uncle, Abu Talib. Primarily why he has not married him, because he feels like, oh no, I know, I have other things to do, I have other obligations. Because Abu Talib took him in, the promise of what he life was just in the of trials. Right, from losing his mom to his grandpa, and you know what I'm saying? Now, Abu Talib is taking him in. He feels a sense of like, I, I don't think I'm ready for marriage yet because the one who took me in, I have to be sure that I take care of them. He has children. He even took in Ali bin Abi Talib as his own son. Like, not like a son, but like as a son, taking care of him as a son with all the responsibilities of that. Right? So, just to make it easy on Abu Talib. So, the circumstances of the Prophet's son's life. And the time are he's very busy trying to make ends meet for his family, working very tough jobs, right? Very real situation. That's why I when, when we picture the Prophet alone, he said them as this supremely elitist, you know, creation of God that has no real attachment to the rest of layman community. Then we have this very fictitious idea that he's angelic, that he doesn't have a normal life. No, he had a very normal life, like he was a pile many normal people do. 25, he's working, just like any of us. 25, he's working to make sure that they stay close. So he doesn't get married, he's single. One day he goes looking for a job. As a shepherd, you go, it's kind of like freelance. You go look for opportunities, you go look for different wealthy people who have, you know what I'm saying, you know, sheep that needs to be grazed or camels that need to be grazed. So one day he stumbles upon one of these, you know, ladies who needs to hire someone. Her name is Hala bin Khoi, the sister of who is eventually to be this Khadija radiallahu anha. So Hala, she's looking for someone to hire. She hears about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and there's another person. She hires the two of them. And they do the work. And they, at the end of the work, they're talking about, okay, now it's time to go get paid. So the partner of the Prophet at this time says to him, he says, well, let's, let's go, let's go collect our wages at the house. The Prophet Sallallahu tells him, no, 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 you go, you go, I'll get it from me, but I'm a little bit shy, I don't want to go. And he said, really? Okay, no problem, he goes. He didn't think much of it, he just left. And then when he gets to the grave, then Hala opens the door, and Khadija happens to be around, happens to be there, right? And Hala will be around, and then he says, look, where's Muhammad? I paid the two, he's like, he's like, no, no, I'm going to take his wages for him, he just, he don't want to come. Why do you want to come? He's just shy. So right there, then Hala's like, Khadija <laughs> Allah is sitting right there. There's nobody more noble, there's nobody more chaste, there's nobody more honorable. Because you know, Khadija is also at this time, she's single. That's what happened. She's putting it in her head right now. Right? So things happening gradually, steps taking place, that's what I want to highlight here. Right? So Hada notices a good man. And she notices that he's exceptionally good because of these qualities. He's honest, he's, uh, he's noble, and he's very chaste, 
Right? So she likes these things, and so she, right away she's suggesting. Khadija will be Allah more. So that's how that interaction ends. A couple days later, Khadija will be Allah more. Let's talk about her a little bit to give you a little background. She comes from not a, like a wealthy family per se from her dad's side, but she was married two times before. To the pro- like before the Prophet she was married two times before. From the first husband, there was children, but there wasn't really a lot of money. There wasn't anything. Right? The second husband, because he had no heirs, she got his money, which was not really that much. It was just a small fortune. Small fortune. Small, not like Trump's like small loan of a million dollars for my dad. Not, not like that, but like good enough to just like invest in something small. Not like a grand empire. It's small, small little business. That's how much money she inherited. And the only reason why she inherited it is because no male from her family is alive at this point. You know what I'm saying? Except for like Wubba Buzzle's cousins, etc. But like from her direct relatives, no one's there. That's the only reason why she's even able to inherit that money because back in Mecca society, when we get inheritance, they wouldn't even get to live most of the time. Right? Forget about inheritance. So she got that because of just that circumstance. Her husband died and left a little money behind. Now she used that money, but these are the Allah had to invest and invest and invest. She would buy goods, she would order goods at the time of Hajj. The time of Hajj, their bootleg Hajj, the pilgrim of Jahiliya time, right? So when the goods would arrive, she would pick them up and then she would go to Syria or send people to Syria to sell those. And then while they were there, she would order stuff from Syria and then she would sell it in other places, right? So that's how she had her business running. But in order for her to do that in a very male dominant society, you need to hire businessmen. You need to hire other men to do your work. So Khadija would have this mulatabah arrangement where she would hire the guy and then they would split the profits maybe 70 30 most of the time. That was acceptable because, again, male dominant society. The fact that I'm even willing to do this for you is a big deal. So based off of that, there's a lot of lying, there's a lot of cheating, there's a lot of like cutting corners, there's a lot of uh, you know what I'm saying, like, you know, no mentions of this was given here or whatever. There was a lot of that, sneaky stuff. But she had no choice, did she? The fact that she's even getting to do business in that society is a big deal. I want you to fully understand her circumstances too. The fact that she's just getting to do business, that's why, again, against her better judgment, she's having all these guys who are just giving her eyes. Until, you know, this incident happens. Obviously, when this incident happens, her mind is going to go first as a businesswoman. What can I? Let me let me test it out through here. Perfect opportunity to test it out. Let me hire him. But then she thinks about okay, but he doesn't really have too much experience with business. He's a shepherd, you know what I'm saying? Even to do business, you need acumen. You need, you need some form of intelligence, right, or experience at the very least. And Subhanallah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doesn't really have too much business experience. She overlooks that because of the character traits that her sister mentioned or highlighted to her. And she sends the first message to him. This is the first time this is an interaction between her and him directly. She sends a messenger over to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Would you be willing to go to Syria for me for a business trip? In Syria, not to Damascus, but to a city called Busra. Busra. So not Basra in Iraq, nor Bursa in Turkey, but Bursa, a city like a little, a little out of Damascus. So in that city, she had a caravan going towards that city, and she had the perfect opportunity to say, would you want to go? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't respond right away. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam engaged him, he said, bring the ticket to my uncle. He goes to Abu Talib, he says, uncle, what do you think? Abu Talib says, this is Khadija we're talking about. The richest, the wealthiest lady of, of, of Mecca, and the most noble of them. And she also, before Islam, in the Jahiliya times, had a nickname, Bahira, the pure, the chaste one. So not only was she known for her wealth, she was also known as a noble lady, like a good, pious chaste, or a good, decent lady. So Abu Badr says, if it comes from Khadija, it's no greater, you must say yes. Go, do it, go for it. He encouraged the Prophet and the Prophet then accepted. And then when he went on that trip, obviously she wants reports. She wants the tea. She wants the intel. She wants to know what happens. What is his movements like? What are he, what, what is he like behind closed doors? How does he interact with people? And how does he get, you know, this title or this reputation that he has in all of Mecca that's the most truthful, the most honest person there is? How do these things come about? 
So she sends Maysa. Maysa is her servant. Maysa goes with the Prophet وسلم, and boy, oh boy, did Maysa see weird things. Strange, unique, and weird, maybe is a strong term, unique things. Things he had never seen before in his life. He started seeing clouds chasing the Prophet وسلم. He started seeing clouds chasing the Prophet وسلم. He started seeing these miracles. And he was like, what is, what is, okay, this is strange. And then he starts seeing, he's dealing with people, and he notices where everyone would say, nah, bro, like, I, there's nothing wrong with it. The Prophet would be like, okay, this is wrong with this, wrong with this, wrong. Like, he noticed all these little things that how everyone else in this situation would do this, but the Prophet unconventionally, contrary to commonplace, despite the fact that there is no divine judicial system compelling him to do so, just on the basis of pure, noble merits of his own good akhlaq, just doing the complete opposite of what everyone does, because he was nice. And because of that, people actually being impressed, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala putting barakah to a point where, now at the end of the trip, they're coming back, and Maisal is looking at their funds, and he's looking at the Prophet and he's trying to make two and two, like, add up, like, this is a person who has no experience doing this, yet he comes back with more than we've ever come back with before. So he's blown, and he's like, this is amazing, and he goes and kills his jet. And then that's it. Khadija Radhi Allah on that song. Right? Her, like, love for him, just, just, subhanAllah, like, enters her heart, and that shows, it's like, it's so, I mean, like, these ideas of nobility, Attract a person to another person. Nothing wrong with that. But what does she do? She doesn't sit on the idea and say, let me go on a couple more business trips to test it out more. Maybe he was doing it this time around because it was a first impression. And he was, no, I don't know if this is going to continue. Let me get to know him a little bit longer. No. Right away, as soon as she felt good about him, she sent a message. Through Nafisa. Nafisa is her friend, like her friend uh, who, who, again, she, they had a conversation before, was speaking past a couple of details, just in, you know, for the sake of time. But they had this conversation before, and Nafisa ends up going and proposing, sending the proposal to the Prophet and his household. Right? So if you're thinking about convention and normalcy and how things happen in reality, like, yeah, even back then it was completely normal for the situation to be only a man proposing to the woman. You know, so like, who are you to even speak? Was told to the women. Who are you to even live? Was their standard motto. So, this is contrary to convention from him, contrary to convention from her, and subhanAllah, everything is just abnormal if you look at it. She's sending the proposal to him, and then now he's receiving it, and subhanAllah, he tells Nafisa, the Prophet ﷺ, like, who would you go? First, Nafisa comes and she says, why aren't you married? And then he gives the reason that I said at the beginning of the lecture. You know what I'm saying? It's a lot of, you know, I'm trying to work, I'm trying. That's my first responsibility. And then the Prophet ﷺ asks her, like, and then who would marry you, though? And then Nafisa says, how about if I tell you a very wealthy, a very noble, a very chaste, a very pious lady? Her name is Khadija, by the way, your boss. <laughs> so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was like, really? Why would she marry me? I'm just a poor orphan. All right? Like then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's trying to be real here with circumstances. Like he's not, he's not also like, a, do you not, this is not him saying no. All right? If he wanted to say no, he clearly could say no. And he said it to you. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was very beautiful. Right? He was not just his character, but even physically. He was a complete package, even before he was a Prophet to everybody in Mecca. So it's not like he didn't have proposals or he didn't have the opportunity to be married. It's just like he was just being real with the circumstances. He didn't let the, his, his physical attributes of attraction, beauty, and his words. He was a very eloquent man. The Prophet was very beautifully eloquent. He couldn't read or write, but he was very eloquent in how he spoke in general. That's why he said, well, I was given comprehensive speech. He could say three words and we have like a five hour lecture over it, 1444 years later. Right? So, that's the Prophet, a literal bachelor to the highest degree, 
yet he's not letting that get to his head, and he's focusing on reality. The circumstances, he's like, look, I'm a poor orphan, and look at where she's coming from. Wealth, nobility, prestige, and everybody wants her. Right? Like, everybody's trying to propose to her. And so, so in his head, realistically, it doesn't make sense. Well, notice, the Prophet Sallallahu doesn't just say things to make it, make it seem like he's just trying to uh, make people feel sorry for him. He doesn't make statements. He said, well, my own people, I know anything that comes out of his life. Anything that comes, the one person came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, you know, I write down, and this is also proof that hadith used to be written down during the life of the Prophet There's many who come after him and say that, no, the Quran, we believe it, but the hadith came way later on. So, no, no, no. In the time of the Prophet the Sahaba were very careful in revising, documenting, and writing down the hadith. Right? So one of the Sahabis, Abdullah ibn Abdul Nas, who used to write down these hadith, asked the Prophet one time, he said, Ya Rasulullah, sometimes you're a human. You say things, and like, maybe you're angry, and you're happy, or you're extra happy. Do I write down everything? Are you just trying to be respectful and have you worded it, but you say, do I write down everything? And the Prophet said, point to his son, he said, everything that comes out of here is true. Right? Everything that comes out of here is true. So when he said that, he wasn't just trying to just, you know, make a casual thing to make it seem even more, like, you know what I'm saying? Some people do that. Make themselves, you know, put themselves in a, a puppy-like situation to make themselves feel even more desirable. It wasn't like that. It was genuinely because he was gauging the circumstances and he felt like it weren't fit. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be fit to what was normal in his time. That was also taken into consideration. Another valuable lesson. With just one question, look how many valuable lessons we're getting at. Why would you want me? I'm just a poor one. Looking at circumstances, looking at what's normal in his circumstances, in his time, for what marriage demands. Right? He's not just letting his emotions get the better of him, is what I'm talking about, with just one little sentence. And then Nafisa says, now how about if I tell you that she actually doesn't mind all of that? The Prophet said, well, obviously at this point, is looking to approval, for approval of the Prophet. Now once the arrangement is made and the nikah date arrives, it's literally, it's just only like three months back and forth of just like talks so, of, you know, like, and, and then to between people, like it's not just, it was them too, right? It was literally just a messenger being sent for this. It's not like, do you think Khadija could have just pulled up with the Allah to the house of the Prophet I mean, she's bold enough to initiate the proposal. Why isn't she just bold enough to pull up? She's a businesswoman who's killing and crushing it in her time in a male dominant society. Why didn't she just pull up? Out of her chastity. Why is she called Fahira? Her chastity, her modesty. She didn't want to see. go up to him. He's sending all these three months of this back and forth, back and forth, trying to get to know one another, trying to get families involved, all of that stuff. And then finally, when the nikah date does happen, or it does arrive, then Khadija radiallahu anha pulls up to the Prophet's home with her uncle, uh, uncle Amr ibn Asad. And Amr ibn Asad is the one to bring her to offer her their wedding, her as her guardian. The Prophet is there with his uncle Abu Talib, and Abu Talib starts the greatest nikah of all time. You know what I'm saying? The greatest nikah of all time is now to be performed. Praise of Allah are made. Then, as there, as was their custom, salutations upon the qualities and nobilities of the Quraysh are enlisted. How they are the custodians of the sacred sites of the Kaaba. Those things are mentioned. And then, the praise of the Prophet is mentioned. That I will give you such a young man who is absolutely noble, the best of young men. Upon 12 upiah and one net of silver, about maybe like four or five hundred dollars, you accept. Amr ibn uh, sorry, Amr ibn Asad, her uncle, her wedding gets up, and he says, We couldn't find anybody better for our girl. And they accept. And the nikah, the greatest nikah of all time, is the No pompous, elegant arrangements of anything. Simple. One little tiny quip. Not even no long quip that the job get from you. Simple, beautiful, and it was The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, thereafter now, you know, this life with Khadija Allah embarks upon, it's a whirlwind of emotions. We talked about now up to how to get married, right? Like how the Prophet got married. Now after the marriage, 
it was just really, you know when they say for better, for worse? There's no better depiction of the human history than between the Prophet and Khadijah. Or the Allah Muhammad. How is it okay for a person to just be okay with their husband disappearing in the cave? In like some random cave that you don't know about for like months on end? And then you're supporting his idea to the point where you're taking him food. Either she's at this point pregnant with Fatima, Rabbi Allah Muhammad, or Fatima is just born and she's an infant and she needs to be taken care of. Between all of these circumstances, Khadija is running back and forth to cave called Hira. You know, go to Amra, when you go to Hira, don't look at the cave the same anymore. Our mother used to run up, run up those mountains to deliver food to the Prophet when she had no idea what he was doing. He had no idea, like subhanAllah, that what he was about to come down. None of this was frequent, but it's just her love for him. She just saw what she saw in him, and that's it. She stayed consistent. She didn't need a constant, everyday reevaluation, a reminder of why she likes him. Because in order for you to be that supportive, when there is no divine law compelling you to go do something like that, and you're doing it anyways, man, that in and of itself is a remarkable manifestation of just pure human love. Something that a Fahira can do. And that's why we tell these stories, because what are trying to be like here? You know what I'm saying? Like that support comes from when she tethered her love to him through Allah. Because nobility, again, they believed in Allah. Even when there was no message, it's, it's not like there was, even the people who believed in, I don't believe in Allah. Why did she say to the Prophet ﷺ when he came back from the cave, terrified? You know what I'm saying? Terrified. And he comes back, what are the words? Now think about them carefully. Analyze every word the Prophet is saying. He's coming back and he's exhibiting absolute paranoia. Absolute fear. There doesn't seem to be a, certain, a sense of very precise direction to that fear. That's kind of why it's fear. Because the Prophet is an extremely brave man from the get-go. You know what I'm saying? Like when he was four years old and Jibika Yisanan came to do the open heart surgery on him, you know, other jits who were around, they saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were like, we ran to our mommies, we just saw he was standing there confronting the angel as a four year old kid. Right? So the Prophet was a brave man. This brave man comes back home in a shock, paranoid. What do you think a standard response should be or could be or would be from an average person? Where do you think that that's not what might happen if you spend all that time alone? Right? Unsavory things like this, could they not be said? Absolutely in a normal circumstance, you'd be like, you know what, really, you don't even tell me why you go and you go and now you come back, you're scared. None of that stuff. He comes back and he's saying, Zami Rumi, Zami scared, cover me, put blankets on me, the Rumi, cover me, I'm shivering, I'm cold. She's covering you, holding you, covering you, telling you, Wallahi, that you see, Kallahu, Abdullah. Wallahi, I swear by Allah. She's taking an oath by Allah, but Allah Azza wa Jalla has not yet, subhanAllah, established upon Himself an entire course of revelation. It's only the first revelation that came back. She's saying, Wallahi, I swear by Allah. What is she swearing? La you see, Kallahu, Abdullah. Allah will never disgrace you. Allah will never humiliate you. And then she starts going down a list of his resume of nobility and why she found him, why she still believes in him. In the Kalatasil of Rahim. You're a very nice to your family. You maintain ties of kinship. You know what I'm saying? You're there for people who need you. When you came of life, you take care of, of, of your guests. When you came to life, you help whenever there is any good cause. Any good cause, you don't question it, you just go there and you help. You don't think twice. You think a person like you is going to be disgraced or put to waste by God? No, a body is not going to happen. That's the word that calms down the Prophet's heart. Iqra' bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. He was too trembling. He was too much of, in a fearful state to recite those words. It was, Wallahi la yuhzik Allahu abad. Wallahi, Allah will never let you go to waste what delivered those that caught this in the that he hugged to us. That was the method, that was the medium. Allah is the one who did it, that's his salam. But the medium of how it got to us, 
through Allah la Allah Allah will never let you be disgraced. It comes from a sense of tethering your love to Him, tethering your love to nobility, tethering your love to qualities, and then you understand that human beings, man, we all got ulu. We all got things that flip around in this chest. This chest is never ever going to have one direction. It's always going to be flipping around. One direction, this direction, this direction. But if the one who's flipping it around is subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's never going to flip in a direction that's wrong. It's never going to flip in a direction that flips you out and gets you sin. It's never going to flip in a direction that lands you in heaven. It's always going to flip, but it's going to flip in good directions. Allah Azza wa Jalla at that point will be cooking their iman to perfection when he's flipping that heart. That's why he sent that whirlwind of emotions to the house of the Prophet. That marriage, Allah says, when you marry and you do it the right way, Allah will put barakah in your home. He guarantees you that. And what do you do? The Prophet وسلم, Did we not find you an orphan and then we gave you a place to stay? Where is the place to stay? The house of Khadija. That's his own house now. This is my house. I'm, the first time. I'm living with my uncle. I'm living with my grandpa. I'm living with this. No. I give you a home now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him respect. And Allah gave him a little bit of a, the taste of what it feels like to live a good life. All just to take it away from him. All just to take it away from him. He gave him sons. The Prophet was one of the most compassionate human. The only human who would, man, to treat a son with the fatherly love that only the Prophet is capable of exhibiting, Basim didn't get that. Abdullah didn't get that. Ibrahim didn't get that. They got it for a little while, and then in infancy, Allah and said, I love you, so I'm taking them back. Khadija, yeah, I'm going to give you the Prophet of Sunnah, but I'm also going to give you a with him a lot of trials. You'll have a good life, and then there's going to come a time where he's going to start preaching that message, and guess what? People are not going to want to buy and sell from you. People are going to want to cut you off. People are not going to, yeah, your daughter were engaged to Abu Lahab's sons? Forget about that now. There's no marriage. There's no marriage. I mean, there's a different reason for why that one broke off, but subhanAllah, there's no marriage between Muslims and non-Muslims. So now Khadija, to make things a little bit more interesting, it'll be Allah anha, doesn't have to participate because it's against Banu Hashim. She's not from Banu Hashim. She doesn't have to participate in that boycott that her husband is going through. It's Allah anha. She could easily feed him through her money. She could easily get his followers stuff through. No, no, no. But she says, no, nah, if all the Muslims are going through this, I don't have enough money to sing all of them. But you know what? What I do have the ability is to not be annoyed. Not to benefit. You know what? I'm not even going to, okay, if, if they want to cut us off, I'm cut off. Voluntarily participated in the boycott and she didn't have to. So finally, Allah took her away. The Prophet said, for him, his love story was literally a test. There was, was a lot of beautiful moments, so many beautiful moments in that home, but really it was all a test. Because after all these beautiful the beautiful moments he had with Khadija, the intimacy that he had with Khadija involved God. The intimacy, so what am I talking about? An intimate moment between him and Khadija was this. He comes home, sorry, the Prophet is home, a normal visitor pulls up, a normal visitor pulling up and says, Jibreel alayhi salam. Jibreel alayhi salam, when he comes in the form of an angel, he only came in that form two times. So normally he comes in the form of a human. Nobody takes different than Kandi. I hope you allow him different than Kandi was very handsome. So he comes and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is sitting there and he says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, look up there. And at a distance he sees Khadija. She's carrying some groceries and food and stuff. She's very weak. Scrape together whatever little she had, and she's walking at a distance. And the sight is a very scary, very, very sad. Like it's tugging at your heartstrings, type of sight. 
The prophet said, is being told by Jibreel Luthi. He said, have we need this Khadija? This is Khadija. As if he doesn't know. This is Khadija. Aqlitha min rubbiha as Tell her that Allah is saying salam to her. Tell her that Allah is sending her salam to her. وَأَمَرَهُ أَنْ يُبَشِّرَهَا بِبَيْتٍ فِي الْجَنَّةِ لَا قَصَدَ فِيهَا وَلَا نَصْرِ مِنْ قَصَدٍ لَا سَخَدَ فِيهَا وَلَا نَصْرِ He said, and give her the glad tidings that Allah is telling her salam wa alaykum khadija and also by the way I want to let you know you're going to have such a beautiful home in Jannah it's going to be made out of a hollow pearl it's going to have no noise in it it's not going to have any complaints. It's literally going to have no foundations. It's going to be so beautiful and it's going to be so pleasant for you to live in. Her home was corrupted with the politics of boycott, so Allah will guarantee you her home in Jannah here in this world. And the way he did it was he sent his mightiest angel to go personally convey a salam from God to her in this earth. So these beautiful moments that the Prophet had with Khadija anha were irreplaceable. Henceforth, when she passed away, anha. It was very likely that it was due to the boycott. She had gotten to a point. Her support for her husband were, was so relentless, it got her to a point where she was eating grass. You know what I'm saying? To survive, she was eating grass. So her physical body actually deteriorated to a point where the Prophet said, as he was lowering her into the grave, like he was a strong man, he was composed, he would cry, but then like he was strong to do these things. But he broke, his tears at that point just started flowing. Because he's looking at this body who took care of him and supported him, and now it's reduced to literally just almost a skeleton. Just out of weakness of, of what she had to go through for the sake of this beautiful deen that Rabbi Allah will know about these things with her, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the opportunity to meet with her in Jannah and also says to not to her, inshallah. That's our mother Khadija radiallahu anha. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, again, a- after she passed away also. It's not like the love ended there just because he was not married and remarried again. His love story continued way after. It was during, it was before, like right, it, as soon as he didn't say no, it started from there. Even after she passed away all the way until he passed away sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Every time he would get anything of value in his house, of something of value would mean a little bit of meat coming in. The Prophet's house was a very, again, you thought, talk about a beautiful marriage, beautiful marriage, a love story, on Instagram terms, looked like a fancy house, it looks like some beautiful cars, it looks like children are going to Ivy League schools, it looks like you live in a nice community, in a nice complex, and you have a good thing going on for yourself, you join the local Pilates class, like, you know, like, whatever, it's, it's just like very, like, fictitious, materialistic outlook on what success looks like in a relationship. This is real success right here, where SubhanAllah, absolutely like no materialism involved whatsoever, from the Prophet of the But even after she passes away, there's still no materialism. Whenever a little bit of any happiness comes in, he would send it to her friends. He would send a little portion of it to her friends. Like her friends, like even after she died, he would make sure that I'm making sure I'm looking after her friends who kept her happy in the place. And subhanAllah, one time, and this is from Aisha, we have only a little time left, I don't have time too much to talk about Aisha, because that's also a very beautiful thing. It's a lot of lessons too. But Aisha, one day says to the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, can I you see you, uh, sorry, can I you see me ala Khadija? He would always do sana. Sana is what do we mean? He's praying of him. Sana, he prays Khadija. But Ahsana, Sana, he would do a great job. He would do it very, very elegantly. You know, and sometimes he would even lose her his words and he would just say, Innaha kana wa kana. She just was and she just was. That's how she would describe her, right? Aisha is still his wife. Look at love on him. One day I just couldn't, I would always hold myself back, but well, one day, and this also shows the the fallen, the, the superiority of Aisha, that this kind of, you know, is sort of telling us one of her embarrassing moments, but to benefit the Ummah, she's sharing it with the world. 
And she's saying that one day I said some unsavory things, things that I shouldn't have said because the Prophet was going in, right? Like he was just talking about her in all these ways. And she's like, I don't like that. You know, Rira, uh, this, this self esteem, self dignity, and I'm also his wife kind of took over. And I said, Ya Rasulullah, like, you know, not tell him that the you always mention her. You know, you always mention her. He says, well, she was, I mean, like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm younger. You know, basically, that's, I don't want to say exactly. She, I'm younger, right? But abdalak Allah hu khayru minha. Those are exact words. Allah has replaced you with something better. Right? Referring to her youth, her age, and all of that stuff. Because Khadija al was older than the Prophet when, when she married him, right? The Prophet didn't you know, look at convention from any standpoint, right? So when she said that, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa do we know him to be a calm person or an angry person? Do we know him a person who, when he is provoked, he gets more calm or he gets more angry? He gets more calm when he's provoked. But not this. This provoked him and this touched his heartstrings so bad, the Prophet said, Wallahi, Allah didn't give him better than that. But Amanah, Allah didn't give him better than that. Allah didn't give him better than that. She believed in me when nobody did. I can't say the rest, but she basically was there for me, and nobody else was there. And the Prophet said that, Aisha Lewis, I didn't say anything again about Khadija, I didn't say anything about Khadija, I didn't say anything about Khadija, I didn't say anything about Khadija. He would say, as soon as her sister, Hala, you know the first lady who put the idea in her head, Hala would be passing by, he would start making it, well, Allahumma Hala, Allahumma Hala, oh Allah, please let it be Hala, please let it be Hala, why? Because Hala used to sound like Khadija, he used to walk like Khadija, talk like Khadija, so it reminded him of Khadija. So he said, Oh Allah, please let it be hard so it could remind him of his story for a little while. This is the Prophet Sallallahu SubhanAllah, his, when, you, when you attach your love to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and Allah is the one doing the flipping to your heart, this is what a love story ends up looking like. But if your love story is being flipped around by your own, and whatever you're viewing on there is your ideal of what you would like to have in your home, and all of your favorite celebrities, and all of the favorite shows that you have, rom-coms, all of that crap. If, for real, if that is what's flipping your heart, then love stories end up in that office with, oh, I uh, don't think we're working out. Couples who really, I'm, I'm, I'm being real here, like, this is real talk, but couples who really, you would think that no chance that this is not gonna work out. They are like this, they are peanut butter, jelly, they're this, they're, oh, I'm not going to work out anymore. Man, it breaks my heart. How many times I've got to hear that before I'm real with y'all and saying that, that like, the, the sources of where we get our love story and our, or where we learn how to mimic love from, is not right. That's what's damaging us. Because we don't realize that when we're observing things, subconsciously we're taking notes, whether we like it or not. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you're watching things on television that you shouldn't be doing, it's not like your brain shut off for a little while. It registered all that information. And do you think it's really going to sit around and do nothing with that information? No, that information is going to drive you nuts until you implement it in some circumstance, and you're going to implement it in your own home. That's going to be the platform for you acting on all the drama that you see on that television, or on the Instagram, or on the online Whatever else it is, I know I sound pretty cringy when I'm using those terms, but you know what I'm saying? Like, all of that stuff is not, that's not our role model. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the kind of Rasuli that he will still last. Only in the Messenger of Allah you have the most excellent of examples, the writers, and everybody that you trained. I mean, I was going to talk about Lil Ba'ani and Fatima, Lil Ba'ani and Aisha and the Prophet, so we don't have much time for all of that. But inshallah, I really do wish that, you know, we can be inspired by this really beautiful story of the Prophet of how much he loved Khadija and how much Khadija loved him so that we can understand the principles of how we can try to ask Allah for the same in our home, in our own homes. But if we're not willing to make any of the sacrifices that we heard in these stories, don't expect the ruminous of it to enter your home either. I hear Allah in a beautiful saying for this. He says, to 
He says to get what you want, you gotta leave what you desire. He says to get what you want, you gotta leave what you desire. I need a new love on this. This is the training of the Bible. So that eloquent didn't come on all on his own. Since the time he was a baby, he was in the house of the Bible, so nothing but pearls like that is going to come out of that now. But it's a very beautiful pearl. It's a very, very, the thing with pearls is they're beautiful. They're hard. You see, they're hard. They're not soft things. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like that. The symbolism is the reality. Anything that you deem to be a pearl of wisdom, anything that you're like doing and crying about, those are going to be hard things to implement. But you really got to give yourself that pep talk and be like, you know what? I got to do the right thing. I got to leave that which I desire for that which I want. That being said, I don't have time to get into all the intricacies of what's allowed and what's not allowed. I'll leave that to the QA. Is that for Black Pay to everybody listening? I hope I did something appropriate with the title of Human Symbol. Is that for Black Pay? Well, I don't know if you know that. 